Welcome to I Care Better, Endo Unplugged, where we talk about all things endometriosis. I'm your host, Jandra Mueller, pelvic floor physical therapist and integrative nutritionist. Hi, welcome back, Shay. Thank you for having me again. (laughs) Of course, we need to hear part two of your story. Yeah, it's a long one. (laughs) It is, but important because, like I said last time, so many people I think actually are going to resonate with a lot of the things that you said. The information is not out there in a lot of the main sites that many people go to for information. So to summarize part one, we heard from Shay's – we heard from Shay their journey essentially from kind of young adolescence – starting period, trying to use tampons, through diagnosis, misdiagnosis, mistreatment, or LISA experience, and the traumatic impact of that during a proper surgery. But Shay has so much more to their story. I am so interested in what you're finding. I know you can't really chat about that here, but we do definitely look forward to what your research findings are. I don't think that there is a lot of information or research focused around what you are doing and patient experience is really important in driving new research and new treatments to better understand not just the disease, but how it impacts people with endo in in general, because research is so focused right now on, honestly, pharmaceuticals, and it's driven by pharmaceutical companies. We do have research that is not, but it still is not really hitting how it impacts people with endo and their livelihood, essentially. In your experience with endo, before we kind of move on into your other diagnosis, being neurodivergent and being, you know, in a queer relationship and identifying that way where the focus is not around fertility per se, for you in particular, but also the focus isn't around penis and vagina sex. Can you talk about different aspects, how that impacted you? In terms of the neurodivergent part, I wasn't diagnosed with that until I was 20 years old. It was like right around my 20th birthday and about a month after my excision surgery. Um, And throughout my life, I had been diagnosed with a variety of things, which is pretty common for people who are assigned female at birth, um, they will literally label you with anything except for autism and ADHD. Um, So I got, you know, generalized anxiety disorder, major depressive disorder, OCD, uh, had bipolar at one point. A lot of that just came from how my autistic and ADHD traits and symptoms showed up is not what falls under the research, you know, and kind of Similarly to how we think about endo research is like how it is kind of kept as such a, you know, very kind of specific group of people. It's going to be, you know, a lot of white middle class people are going to be people who have access to healthcare to get diagnosed, then participate in research. They're usually going to be cisgendered. They're probably going to be, um, you know, in heterosexual relationships, because a lot of people with endo are diagnosed when they start to encounter fertility issues. Um, Mm -hmm. And so similarly, all of the research really on ADHD and autism is done on young boys or people who are assigned male at birth, and it's going to be them on their when they're younger. And generally, people who are assigned female at birth are taught to mask a lot earlier, which is essentially like, learning how to communicate with others and kind of put on a face when you're in different scenarios. And so I was very high masking, but it did come through and like, you know, what we thought were panic attacks were actually like meltdowns and what we thought were, you know, certain fears around like getting sick or obsessive behaviors about getting sick was because I hated the sensory experience of being sick. So interesting. Yeah. And so looking back on my experience with the healthcare system, now knowing that I am autistic and I do have ADHD, that I've kind of realized that, you know, things, certain things for me were a lot harder because, you know, especially later on when I would have, you know, any form of 
pelvic exam attempt, a lot of the times it was non-consensual where I'd be like, no, I don't want to do that. And they had this thing of like, well, you have to prove it. Like we have to do it. Yeah. And I would go like, I now know I would go non-verbal. I would kind of disassociate and, you know, that just led to increased trauma and just Mm -hmm. the experience of dealing with recovery from surgery, dealing with day-to-day symptoms. There's kind of twofold. It's kind of amplified of my symptoms because I have kind of a heightened sensory awareness, but there's also times where I will like be, if I'm really like doing something that I love to be doing, if I'm busy, if my mind's occupied, I won't realize that I have a flare up until it's kind of too late. <laughs> like yeah. there, I didn't have time to like stop and slow down and take a breather and rest uh, because I just don't realize it until my body's like screaming at me to stop. Um, right. And so that was just something interesting to learn. And, and it's something that, you know, I've been over the last year continuing to unpack both like looking back at my childhood and my adolescence and how I seeing things through a different lens essentially. And then also it's impacting how now that I have an awareness of it, I don't want to say that it's gotten worse because that's not really the case. It's just, you know what it is. So you're hyper aware of when symptoms or things are occurring instead of it just being like, a quirky behavior trait (laughs) that, you know, has helped me better explain things to practitioners. It's helped me better prepare for things, but that doesn't like it's having a knowledge is power, I guess, of realizing, okay, the impact that these appointments can have on me, I'm probably gonna have a meltdown. I could have a shutdown, um, stuff like that. I like that you said it doesn't necessarily change how it presents or comes up, those experiences are still often traumatic, often painful. But can you describe how you kind of work around that? Because you have employed some strategies since better understanding it. I've I've learned, it's funny because there was things that I did that I didn't really realize were accommodations for things. Mm-hmm. So like the, the best example that I have is I can't get my blood drawn. I hate it. I faint at the sight of blood. And I just needed to distract myself because I just couldn't focus on like the feeling of like a needle in my arm. And it just made me feel horrible. And so I already started wearing like headphones and sunglasses and stuff like that in a lot of medical facilities because there's like the fluorescent lights and a lot of the kind of medical noises like when you walk into a hospital Mm -hmm. there's like the overhead intercom there's like the beeping of monitors that can be like really overwhelming and overstimulating and so those were kind of things that I already did before I got a diagnosis um in terms of communicating with doctors it just I like it can kind of go like either way it depends on how knowledgeable they are on you know especially how like autistic females can present because people Mm -hmm. still have a very stereotypical image of what being autistic or having ADHD looks like um and a lot of times I don't fit that and and that's just because a lot of autistic traits are kind of seen as normal for girls of like being quiet or um Mm -hmm you know, having emotional outbursts or stuff like that. And so it also helped with having my partner there because she was able to explain in certain times, like, you know, Shay is nonverbal right now, or Shay is having a shutdown or something like that to where if I'm unable to advocate for myself in a particular setting, she's kind of able to step in and there's an explanation for the quote unquote, like odd behavior. Like what's going on? How do we handle this? Is this, should we proceed? Should we not proceed? Yeah. And I mean, with you as like one of my practitioners, I I definitely would be curious if there's things that like you've noticed that we do, because a lot of times it's just something that we do and we don't necessarily realize (laughs) that we're, we're doing anything that's particularly like accommodating or anything. Well, I think one thing we've chatted about that I've noticed you've done in other scenarios moving forward is when you know that you have a lot of appointments set up, 
you've strategically set them up where you have sort of time for processing before the next appointment or with school. Just Mm -hmm. the timing of things can be really helpful. And I think whether or not you consciously did that, I know we had one conversation, you know, maybe we set up appointments. So, you know, for what I forget exactly the scenario that it was just to give time in between, because I think that the processing is just different. It doesn't necessarily mean it's slower or faster. It's it's just different. Yeah. Yeah. I would definitely agree with that because I just like, you know, when you have something like endo and you're recovering from different surgeries and stuff, like there's just so much maintenance care. And so there was really like, I reached like a healthcare burnout point where it was like, I couldn't, you know, no matter how pleasant an experience that I have at a particular, you know, with a particular, you know, physician or practitioner or at a particular office or anything like if I don't have that, like you said, like recovery time almost, because I think a lot of people can understand there's going to be certain situations where you just feel kind of exhausted afterwards. Like even like, you know, it's like you don't want to like run a marathon and then like run a marathon the next day. (laughs) You know, it's kind of like there there has to be kind of time. and, And I've definitely noticed that like I get very like physically and mentally exhausted to where like that is the point when I usually like kind of check out and I'm not really not that I'm not there but it's like I just don't remember things as much and I just kind of feel very blank and my mind goes very blank that took a bit to like figure out because there is kind of this pressure especially when you have endo where there's so many different things that you're treating so many different symptoms that you're trying to like cope with that it's mm-hmm. just like you're just trying to stay ahead of the curve and it's like pretty much impossible and you just – everyone will hit that point eventually, I think. <laughs> totally. And I think many people, however they identify, even with sort of you know our quote-unquote normal nervous system, which I hate even using that word because I think that's where – the whole neurodivergent came from. Actually, can you explain for people that don't know what neurodivergence is? Yeah, so everyone's going to kind of have a different definition of it. The, the definition that I use in my research, because one of my questions is like, do you identify as neurodivergent? Because neurodivergence isn't like a specific diagnosis. It's just if you think differently than like the average person. And so, yes, we realize that everybody is different from everybody else. Everyone's their own human. But there's going to be certain things that cause you to kind of move through the world differently than it appears you do from other people. So what that normally applies to is like like autism spectrum disorder, ADHD, ADD. But it can also include things literally just like anxiety, panic disorder, depression, because you're just functioning differently than a completely physically, mentally healthy person, if that makes sense. At least that's my understanding of it. And and you would kind of consider people who don't appear to have any of those issues as neurotypical. And so yeah. they have like the typical, you know, way that, you know, we consider people to be, you know, physically and mentally fit, but there's going to be people who just think differently or have to do certain accommodations to kind of get through the world. Um, and anybody who has kind of anything that they perceive as that can identify as that. Like there's, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder, there's dyspraxia, there's dyslexia. Like there's so many different things that can fall under that umbrella. That's very helpful. The thing that was really helpful in talking with Lauren was helping you have an easier time coming out of anesthesia. As we know, with the excision surgery, it was rough. And there was a lot of reasons for that. But also anesthesia itself is an issue, clearly. The conversation that I had with Lauren was trying to strategize because I was going to be in your surgery with uh, with Dr. Goldstein and Dr. Yi. Therefore, kind of being there pre and sometimes post-op, is just figuring out how or preparing for something that may go awry where there may be practitioners that don't 
fully understand what that looks like and then react in the way that they're trained to. So some of that was around fidgeting and mo- body movements. And I know for you gain strategies where you have a fidget tool and things like that. But when you're put into a medical setting, especially with anesthesia, waking up from something, not knowing exactly what happened and feeling all these sensations, obviously that's very overwhelming. We talked about things like letting your body move because from a hospital setting, if somebody's not aware, in come the restraints. You know, that's an extreme example, but that's the last thing we'd want to do because For one, the movement isn't necessarily going to harm the patient or the providers, but they may not realize that. So that was something that we talked about. How do we strategize being able to move or communicating that to your medical team? Also, strategies just for you to feel calm. So one thing I think was you liked listening to, I forget if it was music or just somebody talking to you, and we talked about if Haley couldn't be there, can she record something for you that you can listen to? So those are things that are absolutely doable. You just have to think a little bit outside the box to be able to come up with those strategies that ideally will work. I mean, they may not, but it's worth a try. Yeah, yeah. And the the idea behind the movement is like, I'm not, you know, a trained professional in this, but my understanding from a patient perspective is, and, and having, you know, been diagnosed with PTSD and knowing where a lot of my trauma comes from, from my medical, you know, trauma experiences is when you are in a doctor's office, you kind of just have this feeling like I think anybody would experience this of like, you're supposed to sit still, like Mm -hmm. you're supposed to sit still to get your blood drawn. And you know, to they do like a physical exam, there there is kind of just that's just kind of the norm is you're supposed to sit still. But that at least in my experience and potentially for other people who do have like stimming or movement fidgeting type behaviors is just like you're holding in so much energy and while also experiencing something like really uncomfortable and traumatic. And so it just kind of stores in your system. So if you have the ability to kind of release, like, again, I think anybody neurodivergent or not, like you kind of have these random moments where you're just like, I have to shake it off. Like I have to shake off this weird feeling that I have today or I'm going to go for a run. I'm going to like people don't necessarily realize that a lot of what they do is stimming behaviors, Mm -hmm. but that is really difficult to do in medical settings if they aren't trained and what that can look like. Because like you said, they, you know, that's not the, the norm is to sit still and listen and be quiet. And that's going to be difficult for certain groups of people. What I think about too is the impact of trauma. And these can be considered, I think, traumatizing or potentially traumatizing experiences for some. Trauma responses, when we think about fight, flight, or freeze, a freeze response would be almost like something so overwhelming that you disassociate. You can't comprehend it, so you freeze. You don't know what to do. Fight or flight may not serve you in those times. So you kind of disassociate. When people undergo like trauma release experiences or somatic therapies, a number of different ways, one of the things is kind of going through and shaking and tremoring. The best example I've heard is if you see a dog or a cat or an animal almost get hit by a car, you might see them just like violently shaking. And it's a way to help them release that experience. Or even if you don't perceive that particular experience or situation as traumatic, there's something that your body needs to do to release that. Yeah, it's definitely like releasing an energy. Um, I think that there's, you know, even like, you know, when people are excited or scared, like you do shake. I think that's Mm -hmm. something anybody could experience. And that is your body just kind of releasing excess energy. And if that energy is forced to kind of stay in there, that can have a pretty negative impact. We left off, you had the excision surgery, quite the experience. We've found that more than likely due to the use of Oralissa, created some changes that, you know, in a 19, 20 year old individual should not be present, such as vulvar atrophy, smaller than normal ovaries, and then urethral tearing from the catheter, which is not common. I've never seen any of her surgeries, anybody else experience something like that, but it didn't stop there. The other thing that she 
kind of mentioned that I mentioned in part one was the attempts at the vulvar exam or the pelvic exam and just the inability to not be able to do one. As knowledgeable as she is, and I love her to death, she was like, I don't know what's going on because aside from some atrophy, it, it didn't appear that there was anything majorly wrong, you know, crazy inflammation or an infection present which is very common in those with neuroproliferative vestibulodynia. Knowing your history of not being able to use tampons, this started from a young age. These are all really consistent things that we know people with neuroproliferative experience. We did some PT like you talked about, and we focused on some other things. I don't know if we mentioned this or not, but you also eventually did get a DEXA scan and it did show osteoporosis. Yes. Yeah. Speaking of, you know, being disabled or needing a walking aid or things like that, yes, while you are not an 80-year-old woman, you had similar findings as somebody who would naturally go through the aging process and lose hormones. And that's what some of these drugs do, like for Alyssa, they can put you essentially into a menopausal state when you are far from menopause. Just getting yeah. fired up. Do you want to talk a little bit more about your recovery from endo and sort of the next steps and how everything went? Yeah. So, you know, I had gone into the surgery. I had been using the cane for about two months and it was great to have after my surgery during recovery, but it just wasn't improving. And so I think it was at my like three month post-op that Spring Robinson ordered the bone scan Again, it, it was like I had a, like a feeling of like, oh, that can't be it. Like it's probably just like, you know, I have the tight pelvic floor. I have, you know, all these issues. And I actually, after we recorded the first episode, I talked to my mom a little bit. I said some members of the family weren't super cool with me using a mobility aid. And she said, you know, kind of something similar in the sense that like, there was kind of no evidence that they saw that I had mobility issues. But when they found out about, oh, you have crazy bone loss in your hip, it made sense. Yeah. <laughs> Funny enough, I was at um, Universal Halloween Horror Nights with my with Haley and her sisters, and we were waiting in line, and I was like, it was like 10 p.m. I don't know why the results came in that late, but I'm literally like staying there. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> Like looking at my phone and I like turned to Haley oh and I was like, God. yes, who has bone loss? <laughs> and it was so infuriating because like leading up to that, I had been building like a case against this particular doctor who prescribed it. I went to multiple lawyers and basically no one was like going to take my case and everyone was essentially saying, okay, well, we can't prove that the medication did this. Didn't but, they say, no. like, you weren't on it long enough? Yeah, and it was just like, you know, this was a year after me starting the medication that I got this test done, and it was five months after stopping it, and I hadn't, like, regained anything, and I was like, I, I'm a young person, I, my blood work is always good and healthy, like, aside from, you know, the in the eyes of the medical system, I am a healthy person, you mm -hmm. know, taking out the chronic conditions. And none of my conditions should impact my bone density. Still, still got it. And so here we are, like almost another year since that test was done. And, you know, we're still <laughs> working on it and still trying to to deal with it. Yeah, it's a it's it's incredibly frustrating. Right. Because on top of everything, it's really hard to do strengthening exercises the correct way when you have pelvic floor dysfunction, when there's biomechanical issues present. So when we think about the best way, here's my PT brain, the best way to work with those with osteoporosis, we know the best evidence is on weight-bearing exercises. So the tricky thing is, is for people with endo, pelvic floor dysfunction, fatigue, a number of conditions, it's really hard to do regular exercise because of a number of issues. But specifically thinking about pelvic floor issues, when you strengthen, you're going to increase the tone of those muscles. And that's not something you necessarily want to be doing right away until you've gotten full control over everything and you understand what tightness feels like, 
how to relax those muscles, when they should appropriately be firing, because if not, you're going to exacerbate the pelvic floor muscle tension, which may lead to whatever symptoms people are having, whether it's pudendal nerve issues or vulvodynia issues. And then the treatment that's going to help you with the bone loss and strengthening and the biomechanics and walking, you have to say, well, which one's more important? Do I experience more vulvar burning or nerve symptoms to be able to do the appropriate exercises to help my bone loss? Yeah. And even, you know, before all the diagnoses, before starting the Oralissa, like, Exercise was still very difficult for me from both an endo and a vestibulodynia perspective where, you know, another thing about the congenital part is it just gets worse over time. And that was definitely the case for me where, you know, when I was a 12 year old, I was riding my bike everywhere. But by the time I was 16, I couldn't even sit on a bike without like insane pain. I couldn't walk without, you know, like I was saying last time of like walking around outside, I would start to get burning and itching. And then that's not even talking about the cramping and the bloating and the back pain. It's exactly. I think it is good to highlight that because it's like, it is pretty frustrating in a society that's like, when we're especially talking about like body image and the importance of exercise and how exercise is, is like, seen by a lot of people, including, you know, the medical community as like the epitome of health, it can make you kind of feel like a failure of like, or you're not trying hard enough, or you're not, you know, you just need to suck it up and deal with it. But it's, it's really difficult. And then you add in, like you said, there's kind of like a catch 22, right? Like, you have these issues that already make exercise hard, but you have to do exercise to fix another issue. But even if you took your other conditions out of it, exercise would still be hard because of the bone Yes. <laughs> yeah. And luckily you're with somebody who has seen you for a while now. Let's add a- another layer to that. Now, because of certain medications that may help something else, there's weight gain. Let's say you weren't working with a provider that has seen you long term and you go to a new provider. How common is it for them to say, you're overweight and you need to exercise to lose weight. Like it's just another freaking layer on top of everything because of the bias in our society and that weight equals this when that could not be true. But also in certain cases where you need to be on a certain medication that can be helpful, but a side effect is weight gain. Again, you're at this point, what do you choose to do? Yeah, and and I just recently had an experience with that where I went in for my normal yearly exam and I since like, you know, if we look at my weight a year ago, I have gained like a significant amount of weight without really any exercise changes, without really any diet changes, and I have a pretty small appetite already. My I've been working on exercising since May. Um, of like really trying to get back into it. But I was on a medication that essentially shut down my metabolism completely. And I wasn't aware of that at the time. And so I didn't really, I don't know if there's anything I could have done to combat it, but I didn't do anything. (laughs) And, um, and yeah, when I saw this doctor, um, before any blood testing, before anything like that, her advice to me was, eat less, exercise more. And I was like, okay, I hardly eat anyways because of food sensitivities from endo, from nausea, bloating, plus sensory issues. And, you know, there's very specific ways that food has to be prepared. There's very specific ways that like I just need my food to be. So I already have a pretty restricted diet. So that like just wasn't a super cool thing for her to say, just was not helpful And I was like, I'm like, dude, I see two PTs. I go to yoga like four or five times a week. That's like the most I can do. I'm sorry. Like that's, that's all I got. And, and then we get the blood testing back and like everything was normal except for my blood sugar was low because I'm not eating enough. (laughs) So it's just like, it was so insanely frustrating because I was trying to explain to her, I'm like, there could be some hormone stuff going on. I you know, for all I know, there could still be stuff going on in my body from the Oralissa, mm-hmm. you know, being on different birth control pills and IUDs and endo just causing weird hormone issues. And right. she just like flat out refused to test it because she just kind of assumed that she would know what was going to happen. And yeah. 
Yeah, and then now on my medical record, she is putting like obesity on there. And that's just uh, insanely unhelpful on many different levels. No. Now (laughs) you've added on top of everything. If you didn't have it before, you have high risk of developing disordered eating, eating disorders, or many do, right? Because Mm -hmm. that's not helpful. And that advice is not accurate anyways. Eat less and exercise more. We we know if you look at the good research, that's not biased by big food. That's not even how it works. That's not how our biochemistry works. You reduce your food, you change your metabolism. Anyways, that could be a whole nother episode. But yeah, on top of everything, yeah, of course, that's the last thing that you need. And it's just not true. Yeah. Now it's time to address the vulvar symptoms. At that point, you've gotten through and kind of, I don't want to say recovered, but the acute nature of everything from the excision surgery sort of over. And now you're stuck with a big barrier, which is the vulvar pain. Yeah. So like I said, like it was really impacting my daily life. You know, people just kind of look at, oh, vulvar pain, you can't have sex. Like, and that's like the only issue. And it's absolutely not. Couldn't walk, couldn't ride a bike. I had to, you know, you recommend I had to do like a cushion whenever I sat. (laughs) It was like, and it was just so hard to explain and understand. And so I you know, was really excited when you had an idea of what it was, and there was someone for me to go to. And so I had my appointment with Dr. Goldstein about a month or so after my excision surgery, or maybe it was like six weeks, I don't know. So that appointment was by fault of nobody was very hard for me. Um, Already just having anything related to doctors, looking, touching in that area. I had a lot of trauma from, I had a lot of trauma responses from. Thankfully, at that point, I had been diagnosed with PTSD. I got my Xanax. (laughs) Yeah. It was like good to go. Yeah. Goldstein definitely was very enthusiastic. He knew what he was talking about and think it definitely came from a good place. But, you know, when they go in to do the Q-tip test, you kind of, you get in the stirrups and they put a camera on you and there's a TV. So you can kind of the idea is, is okay, let's educate people about their bodies because we all know sex education isn't very good. I do definitely have like some trauma from, you know, those unconsensual exams occurring and me not seeing what was happening. Um, So I definitely see the purpose behind it. And so basically what they do is they will do a Q-tip test and it sucks because they go all around the clock. They see like the vestibule as being like a clock and so they have to do 12 1 2 3 and you have to just go through it and it sucks and then they apply numbing cream to it heads up i was not warned it burns it does, <laughs> it has it light does burn. in it. and then the, they let it sit and then the idea is is if they are able to do that q-tip test again with the numbing cream on it and you don't feel pain it points to having the, you know, excess nerve endings and mast cells that were kind of turned off by the cream. There isn't some other, you know, issue remaining there. I couldn't get through the the test. They basically were just like, after a couple times of me, like whole body seizing Mm -hmm. up and, you know, you're supposed to rate on a scale, you know, they're like, we're just going to put tens on everything. Yeah. Um, Unable due to severe pain. (laughs) Yeah. And then basically, you know, with the camera on it, when we know that Spring Robinson had found vaginal atrophy, that was definitely something that Goldstein was interested in. Again, no fault of anybody aside from the doctor who prescribed the Oralissa. <laughs> um, when they went to kind of open things up to take a look, I just saw it just tear. <laughs> like tear just like from like the opening down, kind of I, similarly to like what I think maybe like people who give birth, it, I think it was that kind of same area, probably mm-hmm. obviously not as extensive as pushing a baby out of you, but you know, it starts bleeding and I watched this happen and it was incredibly painful and God bless them. They were trying to help. They were like, let's put numbing cream on it. But you know, then it burns right into this new... <laughs> new you know cut and of course you know then I just black out like I just completely fainted and that's only like like, blood yeah exactly and so that's you know 
I kind of then consistently became known in the office as the fainter. (laughs) And, you know, then I come to, they finished the test and they figured out that this was the indication. um, And then the, the vestibulectomy is what was recommended. I still had to do the hormone creams because they kind of do that like a topical type thing just to see and make sure because my hormone levels were showing up as fine. But I think that they're like, it wasn't, I wasn't off the oral list long enough at that point for like it to recuperate. You know, it's not like as soon as your hormone levels come back, everything's going to be fixed. It takes more time. And so even though my hormone levels were fine, they're like, you know, we still got to check it. And so I did all the cream and anything and there wasn't any improvement. To kind of orient everybody, we just did have Dr. Goldstein and Dr. Paul Young come on the show and talked a little bit about this and some of the research around it and connecting endo, which we'll talk about a little bit more. The vestibule is a tissue that is inside of the labia minora and it surrounds the urethra and the opening of the vaginal canal. It's very hormone sensitive. And so things like birth control, which is probably the primary cause that we see, especially in in pelvic pain conditions and conditions involving sexual pain in those with vulvas, the tissues can atrophy. And there's a genetic predisposition to having a polymorphism of the androgen receptor gene. And so hormones may come back after hormonal suppression therapy, whether that's birth control or or ELISA, but the local tissues may not come back without some local treatment. You mentioned like your blood test seemed okay. They don't need, you don't need a blood test essentially to diagnose this. I think just Goldstein's practice does this anyways to get a baseline, which I'm always interested in seeing the findings essentially and just seeing where people are. I'm always curious, but you don't need that to diagnose like a vulvar condition that would require local hormones. Many people have been on birth control pills before that have neuroproliferative vestibulodynia, whether it's congenital form or acquired, you know, of course, you're going to try the easy stuff first. But I think for you, they knew it wasn't going to help. They were just hoping that it would help locally your tissue so that you wouldn't have tearing with just spreading of the labia because that was extreme. So I think everyone was like, let's get some local hormones on board to help the tissues. But I don't think that they had any thought that that was going to help the, the vulvar pain. Yeah. That appointment was very scary. Every appointment I had after that, I was like, do not turn on that TV. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I don't want to see. Don't tell me. I don't want to know anything. You know, unfortunately, then again, in your pre-op appointment, they have to do the testing again. But at least this time, I, you know, you kind of know what to expect. And my tissue had healed, um, at least, you know, to the point where it wasn't going to (laughs) tear. It's a shitty process to go through. but you know, it's, it makes sense that they would be kind of as thorough as they are because it is, you know, it's, it's a, you know, they're going to label it, oh, it's a non-invasive minor surgery, but like, that's a very sensitive area. It's, you know, probably mm-hmm. pretty prone to infection. They just kind of want to make sure like, okay, before we actually go in there and do this, let's make sure that like this person actually would benefit from it because the recovery yeah. like isn't horrible, horrible, but it's not comfortable. And it, and it sucks and you have to do all the physical therapy and the dilating and all that stuff. So it's it's a lot of time and money that would be wasted if they weren't 100% sure that, you know, you, that was the right treatment. Yes. I mentioned in part one, I got to be there during your surgery in, mm-hmm. in the operating room, which is always so cool. I love going in there with them because it's a learning process too. He's talking you through everything. It's so great. So. I showed up to your surgery and I think he kind of like snuck me in the back door, essentially. Um, No, I had my paperwork filled out. But (laughs) I go in, I see you, your mom, Haley, um, before you went in and you had your strategies kind of set up for what you were going to do and we got scrubbed in and they brought you in and they were going to put you under and you had some very interesting reactions in the operating room. And even the anesthesiologist was like, this is a little bit bizarre. I think I told you all of this. Um, Mm -hmm. But it took a bit to go under for you. And they, you know, were really great. Okay, this, then this. Dr. Yi's getting ready to operate. And as soon as 
she touched without even any instruments because they set you up where they have to re- retract the labia and everything. As soon as you were touched in that area, you fully had like a knee jerk reaction, but you were under and it took a while to get to that point. And I think that really is telling of nervous system. Mm hmm. Yeah, that was that was really interesting to hear about afterwards, because, of course, you know, when you're put under anesthesia, you do the countdown and then all of a sudden you're awake. I don't have any recollection of of any sort of consciousness during that. And so that was an entirely like. Body primal, (laughs) like nervous system reaction to like, you know, you took that's taking the brain out of it that's taking the trauma out of it that's taking just like you know that kind of pain response you know if we're like when you touch a hot stove how your body just automatically pulls back like there's still a level of like consciousness and awareness to that but that was just completely yeah yeah. no it was comp you were under they ensured that and it was yes like you said earlier primal reflex It was very interesting because I've been in several of these surgeries. I've been in other surgeries, and I think it baffled all of us, really. Yeah, and so that's, you know, it it took a while for the, you know, you have to go through the recovery. You have to – we had, like, some, like, kind of little complications with the recovery with, like, the stitches and stuff, and you have to wait for the test – like, the biopsies and all that jazz to come back, but, like – that still kind of indicates like something weird because if it mm-hmm. if it's just like a skin condition or something like that, I don't feel like you like the body would have that kind of reaction. It would really have to be nerve mm-hmm. focused. So your biopsy did come back and it showed Yeah, the congenital neuroproliferative vestibulodynia. So I was probably born with it again, just developed over time. Um, and you know, we've made the connections with the mast cell activation syndrome. Uh, and like you said, that is also connected to endo and now they're starting to find connections between the endo and the vestibulodynia. Um, and so that's, it's all probably, I mean, it's all inflammation, right? So it makes sense that it would all be kind of interconnected. We just don't hundred percent know exactly where that, that Mm -hmm. comes from yet. Well, I think the inflammation is the result of having excess mast cells or dysfunctional mast cells. In this case, it's actually proliferative, which is slightly different than mast cell activation syndrome. So that's where they're really trying to understand, is this a local presentation of a systemic syndrome? Is there more to it? Uh, Dr. Dempsey kind of explains like mastocytosis is sort of like a cancer where proliferation is kind of the key aspect. But mast cell activation syndrome, there isn't necessarily more mast cells or proliferation of mast cells, but they're dysfunctional. So the findings that Dr. Goldstein is finding, I think are really interesting because it's sort of a cross between. So what they're stating for and what they found in your biopsy was that, in fact, there were excess nerve endings and excess mast cells that are not supposed to be there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you get a shirt from him? He, he in the beginning he was so excited. He was putting stains on shirts. I did, hear, I did hear that from people. I did not receive that. I don't know if that's something that he does anymore, but I did hear that from people because something that he does is he has like a list of patients who consent to having like their email or phone number shared and when you become a new patient and it like looks like you're going to be having surgery, he sends you like these like behemoth of emails. <laughs> With, like, all of his research articles with, like, pictures and videos and just tips for recovery, things that other patients have made, like, lists for, like, best things to have during recovery. Um, And then it has everybody's information. And so, you know, I'm on that list. I get inquiries from people pretty frequently. And that's definitely something that I did before my surgery. Um, and yeah, that was, that was something I, <laughs> I heard from folks. <laughs> I was cracking up like Erwin, no one knows what this is, but I love it. And I love that you love it. It was really funny. I think he might've only done it honestly, like one time. I don't think it was a whole thing, but it was pretty funny. I know other people who have talked with you that you've been very helpful in kind of sharing your story and helping them navigate this because I've never gone through this. So I, the the vestibulectomy, but it sounds scary. 
you're like my vulva vagina is going to be completely different but it's quite shocking the end result but that's scary yeah and you know i think anybody like and like nobody likes getting a pelvic exam no, like that's you know it's kind of like with, with endo when people are like oh my god I have painful periods too and you're like no you don't you don't know what real painful periods are um it, it's kind of similar where you know I think that a lot of people can kind of relate to that sort of visceral like Ugh, I don't want to be because it's a sk- especially once it's explained to you like, I'm sure that Goldstein probably explained it, but my understanding of it is, is they literally take out a circle of tissue and then they have to stitch in a circle everything back together. And you yep. have to live with those stitches. You have to, you know, fear the popping of those stitches. Mm-hmm. And, um, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a really scary thing. Um, and, and, you know, that's taking out the, you know, neurodivergence that's taking out the the trauma, like anybody is going to be scared shitless to have a surgery like that. Um, yeah. It's not fun. <laughs> it's no, not fun. but it's better for people to be prepared and have the tools that would be genuinely helpful for them than kind of hearing, you know, sunshine and rainbows. Because of course, people want to like, know, okay, do you have good results from this? But it's like, yeah, yeah I did. But it also took a lot of work to get here. So to share a little bit about how you were from my standpoint prior to going into that surgery, though you made significant progress even before undergoing the surgery, to give people that don't really understand what happens in pelvic floor PT is we do a number of things. It could be external too, but when we get to doing the internal exam, there has to be some degree of your legs being open. You're not on stirrups. Usually we support with pillows. Sometimes people's just feet are on the table, kind of knees bent up. We call it a hook line position. I find that it's easier and most comfortable for people to just kind of almost be in like a butterfly stretch, pillow supported. But even you getting your knees kind of spread open, there was shaking there was a lot of hesitation. And I think we even worked on just like gentle touch. Here's my hand. Feel this just to get used to the feeling. And I think we did that for a few sessions before even getting to to doing any touching around the vulva, just to help that desensitization process. And so that got a lot better, but there was still no way we were going to do internal that entire time. Even touching in and around the vulva, it was, nope, can't do it. That became significantly different after the surgery. Luckily, we had had time to kind of work on that desensitization of just going in and around. You were able to like just lay down, assume the position, you know, which I found so compelling that even without that surgery, you were able to kind of just be relaxed in in that form. Mm -hmm. And then post-op, what was your reaction post-op when either I or he redid some of the Q-tip testing aside from the one area with the stitch. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So, um, well, the, the first thing is, is because obviously that's a really sensitive area regardless you had, I I think I had something like a hundred stitches or it was like a, a pretty insane amount of stitches. So it's, you're not gonna know that's gonna, it's a surgical site. It's gonna be painful for a while, but like the first day Haley reminded me about the belly button thing. The belly button thing, I don't know, is like entirely proven or or anything like that. But Goldstein said that some people who have the neuroproliferative type generally have some sort of belly button like sensitivity. And mm-hmm. that was definitely something that I had. Um, and essentially, it's like, it's kind of hard to explain because I think anyone would be like, oh, well, yeah, it's going to be uncomfortable with someone touching your belly button. But it, it's, it just, it hurt. Like, it, it's, it's kind of hard to explain. But um, the idea is, is that the the nerves are somehow connected. And pretty quickly after I had like none of that sensation anymore, in my belly button. And so that Goldstein felt was like a really good sign. When I think I went to Goldstein first, because he had to clear me for PT. Mm-hmm. Um, so they did the Q-tip test. 
I think for the most part, except for like a couple of areas, I know 12 o'clock was like a problem area. And then wherever that stitch was, I think it was like Mm -hmm. 10 o'clock. Essentially, I had a stitch that got kind of like embedded, I guess, in the skin. It just didn't dissolve correctly. Um, So that remained pretty irritated for a while. Not like as noticeably as like when I like pre-surgery about how I would just feel like sitting down or walking around. It wasn't, it was only when it was like kind of aggravated. Um, and so, yeah, it was just like, it was such a strange feeling to experience sensation there and have it like not be painful. And it's, it, it's impossible to describe if like, because a lot of like healing type stuff is going to be like really long going, right? Like if you like, I don't know, like break a bone or something, like you don't have this kind of immediate like, oh, it feels completely better now. It's like, Mm -hmm. it happens over time of like, you don't necessarily notice it because it's just happening kind of slowly and it's your daily life. But it was such a like, quick thing of like it literally going from like 100 to zero Mm -hmm. which is so hard to describe um and then with PT I think it was literally like my first or second appointment back with you that you were like oh by the way like I'm inside and I was like oh (laughs) and I just had like no idea because I'd never experienced that before and it was just like and you know we just are chatting and and talking how we usually do Mm -hmm. and Oh, and you were just like, yeah, so you just completed your first pelvic exam. (laughs) And so, I mean, that that shows it, right, of like the difference between how it was before where I had difficulty even like relaxing my legs and dealing with any sort of touch to where like not only was that not an issue before, but we were able to do something that I never really experienced before. And I kind of did, I didn't notice really until you told me. (laughs) I know, very different than when you thought, Whispering Robinson, I did it. How far did you get? She's like this much, fully done inside the pelvis. It was amazing. It's one of my favorite parts of being a PT is to get to experience that with individuals who have never been able to do that. And it's so incredible to be able to be part of that process and experience that and see the the excitement or the shock or the disbelief in patients, especially that undergo the surgery. It's incredible. Yeah. And, you know, the, the, it took a while for me to, you know, be able to do certain things. You have to wait to be cleared for things as, as things heal. But like, I I was so excited when I got to like ride a bike again. Mm -hmm. And like, I was able to take the cushion out of my car and I could sit and like tolerate like a long car ride. You know, I could wear, um, like different like underwear again and I could wear jeans again like there's just like there were so many things that like in a pretty quick succession like once I hit that like healed point mm-hmm. um, was something that I just thought like what weren't options for me anymore yeah it was a pretty life changing experience yeah those little things you don't think about you have to think so much about yeah yeah. And I mean, in terms of, of the recovery too, like it, it sucked, but like after the first like two weeks, I was like, I was pretty good again with being autistic recovery is not fun, especially because after this one, you have to like, you can't eat solid foods until you have a bowel movement because the idea is, is you don't want to, you know, pop a stitch essentially. Mm-hmm. So I hated being hungry (laughs) like at one point like Haley like I couldn't eat and she like made something that I liked it was probably like pasta or something and she was sitting there eating next to me and I just burst into tears and she was like why are you crying I was like why are you eating in front of me (laughs) yeah and you know having to go to the bathroom is pretty uncomfortable and stuff like that but like especially compared to the endo surgery it felt like a much quicker recovery in terms of like getting back to your life because it is contained to like a pretty small area. I mean, again, it's, I would consider it a major surgery. It's a very scary, uncomfortable place. Um, But in terms of like getting back to daily activities, most of my recovery was like what I felt like pre-surgery, 
Like there was yeah. just, you know, couldn't wear certain kinds of underwear, couldn't had to ice every once in a while. And it sucks the first couple of weeks, but you can kind of get back to your life pretty quickly. And then, you know, in the grand scheme of things, at least for me, and I, I had the surgery relatively young compared to like most people, most people, you know, I by, you know, just a stroke of good luck, happened to move to San Diego for school and happened to see Spring Robinson because I happened to come across Merit and Spring Robinson happened to refer me to you. It's just like, there was a lot of things that had to happen for for me to, you know, land in that OR. And I was pretty, pretty young. And the recovery, like in the grand scheme of how long I had symptoms was really like nothing in terms of what the results ended up being. It's always so interesting to hear patients' perspective on these two surgeries because now I've seen several people that have both, which I did prior to seeing Dr. Yang's lecture at Iswish, and which I knew that there was some connection. And then now that's stemmed into this whole new thing where all these providers are getting together But I think in general, those that have undergone excision surgery and a vestibulectomy, I think that they would probably all agree that the vestibulectomy, or the majority of them, that the vestibulectomy was probably much worse. But I think just given your experience with the excision surgery and all that came from that, yeah, of course. Yeah. I totally can see that. It's just so interesting. Those things that determine how surgery will be and recovery. But I also suppose that, like you said, with the neuroproliferative piece, many other surgeries that require some time before pain goes away, but that was an area of severe pain for you previously. And so some of it may be similar, but in a lot of ways, also different and better. So I guess I also see both both of those sides of things why somebody might think one is easier than the other. You know, it's especially with the endosurgery, people's recovery can be so different. Like, you know, I've, I've met people who had to have like bowel resections and, you know, unexpected hysterectomies or ophorectomies or, you know, stuff like that. So it, it's gonna, I feel like the excision can vary a lot more than the vestibulectomy Um, especially now that it's pretty like there was kind of the difference before whether or not people were taking the 12 o'clock or not. Um, But now it's pretty across the board where a lot of people are having pretty much the same procedure, whereas excision is going to be so different person to person. So it really just kind of depends on, you know, what, how extensive your endo is. If you do have these uh, kind of additional surgeries within, you know, the, the surgery Um, and you know, any complications that occur. I'm so glad you came on the show and shared your story. Uh, Both parts of it, so important. And you really kind of are the perfect example of discussing what we're now seeing is more connected. And my hope is that people listening to this that have struggled with not understanding why they can't use tampons or why they have pain with intercourse, whether or not they've had a good excision surgery might give some light to, might shed some light into what else is going on so that they can get help too. Interestingly, in talking with Dr. Goldstein, he shared that there is often a seven to 10 year delay in diagnosis of Mm. neuroproliferative. Yeah. And, you know, especially now that they're kind of looking at the impact of mast cells and like realizing at least in my experience has been like really enlightening and almost like relieving of like the kind of allergy mast cell type symptoms that I have. It it just, when you feel like you have so many different problems that you're trying to tackle all at once, when you have like, for me, I have like the allergies, I have asthma, I have eye issues, I have ear issues, I have, you know, the endo, I had the vestibulectomy and like all the symptoms that come with all of those conditions. And it's, it's almost kind of relieving to know that they could all be connected. And it's not just, I just have all of these problems. It's like everything's connected and everything has a reason. And I hope that other people can kind of see those connections because that can help them 
understand, you know, oh, like if I have these symptoms and these experiences together, that could mean this thing. And Mm -hmm. it's, you know, the human body is so weird and so strange. It makes no sense. And it's scary because everyone who's studying the human body is also in a human body. (laughs) So there's still a lot, you know, that's, it's, it's a, it's a weird place to be in when you realize like, oh, people don't know everything and you're Mm -hmm. just trying to figure it out on your own. So, and that's going to happen for different people at different stages of their life. But, you know, things are connected or could be connected. And, and it's, I think, important to remember that and have a pretty interdisciplinary care plan. Absolutely. So what you're saying is my 15 different things could all maybe related to one thing. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And it, at this point where we are with medicine and how we practice medicine and how physicians are trained, unfortunately, we really strive to find that one provider that can treat everything. But right now we're not there. And hopefully with stories like yours, with curious providers who are doing research, we can better understand the connection. And maybe every doctor can't do everything, but at least we start the conversation with, I think you have this. I can't help you personally with that, but I'm going to refer you to this person who can and stop this ridiculous delay of diagnosis of all these conditions. Yeah, that's usually my my when I've done talks before um, with you know medical students or providers and or just even like when we were at Ishwish and I would just talk to different providers and they'd be like, "What's your one thing you know that you would want us to know?" And it's always like I, a lot of my issues could have been prevented or like complications and misdiagnoses and delayed diagnoses could have been avoided if you had less of an ego. (laughs) You know, it's everybody's human. You don't know everything. And so I think a lot of practitioners need to learn like that's okay. You know, like it's we much prefer that you refer us to someone who you feel would be helpful, who would know what to do, than continue to try to do it from what your knowledge is, because that just it's a waste of time, everybody's time, everybody's money. And, you know, it's just accept that you don't know everything and that's okay, but make sure that you find people who can and who, you know, can help the people that you're, that you're trying to support. Yes. You did something that was very brave and I admire you so much for doing it. I wish more people would do it. You made a very good attempt at trying to make that change. So many people just leave the provider that they previously were working with and don't go back, don't say anything, which I also think leaves them thinking that they helped you when they did not because of fear of retaliation or if they need to go back to that provider, a number of different reasons. Can you talk about what you did? Yeah. So um, the first, that pediatric gynecologist that I had um, you know, she did the ablation surgery. She shouldn't have done that. She misdiagnosed me with lichen sclerosis. Vestibular tinea never came up. Uh, she sent me to a really not good pelvic PT, at least in my experience. Um, and so I just kind of, I, I made the choice having, you know, not really, I haven't been in her care for about three years, and I now had figured everything out. And so I made the decision to write her a letter um, with the best intentions. And and I, you know, again, autistic, I don't know how things are going to come across. Um, but I did it with, you know, as much care and compassion that I could of like, I just want to educate you so that you can better serve other people. And, you know, having had the experience that I've had since then with both good and bad practitioners, um, this is what you could have done differently. Um, and I, I kind of got the idea. There's a there's a book about um, like the the bias of women in research and in, in medicine. And and that is a thing because a lot of women have chronic conditions and they will just keep going to different doctors until they can figure it out you know, 
like you said, doctors aren't going to know that they did something poorly. So that doctor could be sitting at home thinking, oh my God, I did the perfect thing for this patient and I did everything right. And it's, it's hard to accept that you could have harmed someone, especially in medicine where you could have harmed someone, you know, both physically and mentally, like there's a lot of room for error. Um, but the hope behind it was that, you know, she would learn from her mistakes that she made with me and that that would hopefully prevent that from happening to other people. Yeah. Well, I thought you did a great job. You shared the letter with me and I thought that you approached it with clear intentions that this was just to share your experience in that it will help other people. But I also think that there was some true like emotion that came through from the experience you had and and sort of being wronged. I think it was an appropriate level of emotion that shone through, but also, you know, professional. Did you ever hear anything from that? I'm curious. Of course not. Yeah. <laughs> and I I can I can hope that she at least read it and it didn't, you know, immediately go into the trash after the first couple of sentences. Um, but that's, you know, why I, you know, continue to try to do opportunities like this where it's like you know, for both patients and practitioners, there's something to learn from anybody's experience. But particularly as someone who has had a lot of experience in the medical system from a very young age and have seen so many different doctors for so many different things and had so many different experiences, it's it sucks that, you know, I have to <laughs> I have to do this. And but it's you know, I, I feel that it's necessary. Mm -hmm. After sending it, and now a few months have gone by and no response, is there anything that you would have changed in what you put in the letter or how you approached it? Um, I don't think so because I was I was very careful in how I worded it because I knew that it could be done very incorrectly. It could come across as you know very confrontational and angry, and obviously, like you said, I have emotions about it and you know, I have resentment and I have anger and I have regrets about things. Um, but no one's going to listen to you from that perspective. So I was very conscious of that when I was writing it and editing it and, you know, rereading it a billion times before I actually put it in the mail. Um, and so, yeah, I don't, I don't think anything. Cause I, I, I haven't necessarily also learned anything new since that I sent it that, you know, would change how I feel about the different actions that she did. There was a lot mm -hmm. of things that she did wrong. And I, and I still believe that based off of experiences I've had since then and the research that has occurred since then. And, um, yeah. or honestly the research that existed at the time that she clearly wasn't educated on. <laughs> yes. I thought that you did a great job in being able to balance the professionalism, but also the emotion. We're human. We have emotion. And so I, I think it was really great. And I was so proud of you that you did that. And I do wish more people would do that. But I also understand the society and world we live in. It's, it's hard to do that. Yeah. And that's something, you know, that I've spent a lot of time working through in therapy and that I've tried explaining to my th family is we kind of see doctors as like the like best of the best of society. You know, they're the highest achieving, they're the smartest, they are selfless and that they help people. But the more interactions you have with the medical system and with medical providers and the different issues that you have, you're going to learn about biases you're going to learn about things like, you know, pharmaceutical cutbacks, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, stuff like that, where you will come to realize that doctors are humans too. And I applaud doctors. I think doctors are amazing. Um, they obviously are very selfless people, but there's, you know, I hate this term, but there's going to be a bad apple among yeah. any profession and it can just be particularly dangerous in the medical profession. So you kind of have to balance this understanding of, okay, they're human and they deserve compassion and empathy and understanding when they do have mistakes, but we also shouldn't put these people necessarily on a pedestal and expect them to know everything and do everything perfectly because that's not fair on us as a patient. That puts us at risk. And mm -hmm. that's also not fair on the providers 
because, you know, who wants to be put in that position, you know? So it's, it's yeah. a weird, it's a weird tr- thing to kind of think through and, and kind of have to constantly work through, but it's, you know, I don't know if this is something that everybody realizes as they get older, but you know, it's how like people are teaching kids nowadays of like, you know, what is appropriate and not an appropriate thing for adults to do. Whereas mm-hmm. before it was like, just respect adults. It's yes. like, <laughs> You know, and, and like, you have to respect these particular groups of people, regardless of what you do, like they, they do to you, essentially, if they're rude to you, you have to be put your smile on, you got to be polite. But yeah. when it comes to your health, you do have to reach a certain point where, of course, you should be polite and respectful. But that doesn't mean shutting up and not sharing yeah. your opinions or your feelings. Well, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your story and all the insights. It was Very insightful working with you as a patient. I've learned things and I hope, I know people will really resonate with many things that you said. So thank you again. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I, I always appreciate the opportunity to share this stuff because it is important and it's not talked about enough. And thankfully, you know, at least Endo is starting to get some more traction in the media and, and, you know, a lot of people you'll come across will know what it is, but that doesn't mean that they necessarily have a accurate understanding of it. And and that's not even talking about vestibulodynia or neurodivergence or being non-binary. Like there's there's a lot of facets of people's identities that, you know, all intersect and all impact how you walk through the world and interact with things like the medical system. So, you know, it's it's a learning curve for everybody, but you know just be compassionate with yourself and be compassionate with others, but don't, you know, listen to your gut is always my, my number one (laughs) piece of advice. Yes. Great advice. Well, thank you again. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Endo Unplugged presented by I Care Better. We hope you found our discussion insightful and empowering. Remember, you are not alone in your journey with endometriosis. Together, we can raise awareness, support one another, and drive positive change in the understanding and management of this condition. Tune in weekly to I Care Better Endo Unplugged for more inspiring conversations, expert insights, and practical tips to help you navigate life with endometriosis. If you have any questions, suggestions, or personal stories you'd like to share, we'd love to hear from you. Connect with us on our website, iCareBetter.com, or social media platforms at iCareBetter. And let's continue this conversation. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. Together, we can make a difference for those living with endometriosis. Endometriosis.